Welcome back to another edition of the BrownZone.com Zone Coverage Podcast. Talking about the second week of training camp and getting ready for the first preseason game of the 2019 season. My name is Andy Bullbarch with AM 930 WEOL. Joined alongside Browns beat reporter Scott Petrak with the Chronicle Telegram, the Medina Gazette, and of course, BrownZone.com. Scott, great to be joined by you once again. And well, we're cruising right along yeah. here as training camp is already a couple weeks in. First preseason game coming up on Thursday night. Uh, there's a lot to talk about this week. Yeah, there is. There's been a ton going on. You had the Bron- orange and brown scrimmage. You've had a bunch of practices. I mean, Freddie Kitchens has had nine straight practices in pads, and I don't remember a coach doing it. And if you're practicing in pads, it means a lot of action and maybe a little bit of injury too. So we'll get into all of that, the physicality, the injuries, and there's a ton to dive into here over the next half hour and change. I want to start with something, though, I think that made the rounds over the weekend and certainly seemed to light a fire under Freddie Kitchens, that's for sure. Boy, the whole Bob Wiley saga. He seemed to be a guy that was tremendously well-liked, and I'm sure in certain parts he still is, you know, going back to the the gut hut last year. (laughs) You know, that certainly seemed to get people pretty fired up. People got behind that, but... Boy, this thing took a turn for the worse, and it's one of those deals where I think Freddie Kitchens going back a couple days, he he was pretty fired up about this. He was, and, you know, Bob is a likable guy, I think. I didn't spend a ton of time with him, but I've talked to him a few times. And likable guy, likes to tell stories, likes to talk. So when he gets asked to go on TV or the radio, he just talks, and he has has opinions. And one of his big opinions was that John Dorsey – wouldn't feel comfortable hiring a guy like Greg Williams who had such a strong, such strong opinions. And that's what Bob said. And he didn't want to go head to head to him because John Dorsey went head to head with Andy Reid a little bit in Kansas City and lost out. This is Bob Wiley's opinion. So that ruffled some feathers. And then about Freddie Kitchens, you know, Freddie got a lot of credit and he got a chance to be the head coach. And Bob Wiley's view is a lot of that's based on what his assistant coaches did last year, right? Bob would handle protections and Kenny Zampezi, the quarterback coach, would you know, Tudor Baker, and then all of a sudden, Freddie gets the interview, Freddie gets the job, and then most of those coaches are gone. You know, Bob called the collateral damage, and he gave a lot of credit to those assistant coaches, including Kenny Zampezi involving Baker Mayfield, and and Freddie didn't appreciate that. And Freddie had a chance to talk about it Monday, and and he started his press conference by saying, I respect Bob, I'm not going to say anything bad, he's a dad, he's a granddad. And then he couldn't help himself and went on to blast Bob Wiley. And, you know, you can say that it was justified because Bob had taken some shots at Freddie. I would just say that I'm always I'm always a proponent of taking the high road. And I thought Freddie didn't do that. He had a chance to, and not to say he's wrong, but I would have preferred, just my opinion, if Freddie had taken the high road there and said, hey, I respect Bob. Bob did a good job for me. Bob's a good line coach. We're going to leave it there. I like the staff that I hired, period. And instead, he kind of dragged Bob through the mud a little bit. And I'm sure Bob Wiley regrets saying what he did because, you know, Browns fans love Bob Wiley. Now some have turned against him because Freddie's so popular right now. He absolutely is because you're right. I think if another coach had done that, you have to imagine there may have been a little bit of pushback. But again, right now, Freddie's hot. I mean, he's the talk of the town. And you know, his demeanor in camp certainly seems to stand out to a lot yeah. of folks. And I think for a lot of the fans who don't get the opportunity to go to camp, all they know about Freddie Kitchens is what they see or what they hear in some of these press conferences that he holds on a daily basis. What are some of your major takeaways yeah. about his demeanor in camp so far? Well, surprising to me. And, and I think the reason is training camp is the only time – well, the off season and then training camp are the only times the media gets to watch all of practice. So once the season starts, we get about 20 minutes or a half hour. It's a lot of stretching, a little bit of individual drills. So you don't get to see the heat of the moment, the heat of the battle. So when Freddie became offensive coordinator last year, it was after we'd seen everything. He was a running backs coach. He was off my radar for most of last year. So I never really got to watch Freddie coach during practice. Well, now we are, and we get to see all of it. And he's yelling and screaming and F-bombing pretty much anybody in sight. Not for no reason, but if somebody screws up, it's players. It's the guy spotting the ball. It's the officials. You know, they have like high school and college officials come in, and he's all over these guys. He was all over the guy, the water boys the other day. So he has an intensity to him that I think is genuine. I don't think it's made up. I don't think he's putting on a show. I think it's genuine. But I think if you just talk to Freddie away from football, you might not 
get that intensity. You think, oh, he comes off as a low laid back, he's an easygoing Southern guy. He's got some fire burning, and that might be the right tone for this team, right? That might be the right persona needed for this young team that hasn't proven anything. But it's just to me, it's just interesting because I didn't expect that when I showed up for practice, and it's consistent. It's day in, day out. I think he carries that over even in his press conferences. He has some fire in him. He's got a little defensiveness in him. So, yeah, you can argue whether or not he should be swearing all the time. I think or not, you need to yell at officials during practice all the time, every day. But I think it is who he is, and it just shows you the intensity. And we talked a little bit about the physical nature of practice. I, I think they go hand in hand. Freddie's intensity and the intensity of practices, you can't separate those. And I think that's been a theme throughout these 11 practices. And it seemed like that was certainly some of the one of the things to take away from the brown and orange scrimmage on Saturday. Boy, what an impressive showing. I mean, you're talking about nearly 40,000 yep. fans showing up for that on Saturday. What were some of your major takeaways? Any real strong individual standout performances? Well, you know, I, I want to start with the kickers just because they're easy to watch, right? They're in the middle of the field. You get to see if they're good or bad. You can, you know, it's a make or a miss. It's easy to judge when the rest of the positions are not quite as easy sometimes. Greg Joseph was perfect, and I think he's had the lead from day one. Uh, Austin Seibert has been up and down. He had a decent day Tuesday, and he he made one more kick than Joseph did. But overall, Joseph's been better. It's harder to kick in the stadium. Joseph made every kick in the stadium. So he stood out to me. And then a guy like tight end Farrell Brown. He's from the east side, went to brush high. Was here a little bit last year, didn't do much. When I watch him day in and day out, he struggles to catch the ball, right? It just doesn't look as natural as some other tight ends. Now, it doesn't mean he drops all of them, but there'll be a play or two where he juggles it or he fights it or bangs off his hands. Well, he was in there with the ones a lot on Saturday because uh, Demetrius Harris and set the valve have concussions. David Njoku feels like he's nursing something because he's in and out of the lineup. So Farrell Brown was in there with the ones, and took advantage. He made a bunch of catches. He had a touchdown catch, and he strung, to use the word of Freddie's, he strung some nice plays together. So he stood out to me because halfway through, you know, it's way too early to make these judgments, but eight days into camp, I said, well, he's cut, right? I don't know what they're going to do tight end, but he's cut. And then he made it, had a good day there. He came back and had another decent day after that, and I said, say, okay, maybe this guy has a chance to stick around, depending on what happens with the rest of the roster and the rest of the tight ends. And then Derek Willies, the receiver. I have him on this team, and I did even before the scrimmage. But he not only has he started to make more plays and started to come on, he gives you a different physical stature than the rest of the receivers, right? OBJ, Jarvis, Callaway, they're all about 5'11", 6 foot, 5'10", and this guy's 6'4", big, and I think he gives you another dimension that you would like in an offense. And he was out there with the ones. It was Jarvis, Odell, And Derek Willies is the three receivers in that first team set. And if you're getting those reps, that means the coaches in the front office are at least intrigued enough, right? And we saw Willies flash a little bit last year. Then he got hurt. He's the guy to me that unless he falls off a cliff or gets hurt again, I think he's on this roster. And depending on how the rest of the preseason goes, and there's a long way to go, could be a guy that gets meaningful reps once we get to the season. Is he the kind of guy, but just based on the description of him that you just laid out, he seems like the kind of guy that profiles as the possession receiver, to use a term of the past, and also the kind of guy that if you're going to throw some screens, you need a yeah. big, able body out there in those areas to lay some blocks down, don't you? Well, I agree, I agree with the blocking completely. I think he has a physical nature to him. He's not – it's like he's jacked up, but he's bigger. Um, I just like the complimentary nature of him because Jarvis is a possession type receiver. So if you have Jarvis as your possession guy and you have Odell taking a bunch of attention on the other side, Willis could be a guy that runs, you know, a 15 yard in and it's one on one coverage and the safety is nowhere near him and it's an easy completion. Like I could see some of those. He had a catch and run against the Ravens in that one game that they won at home last year. It's a big play, so he has athleticism. And you talk about the red zone and Odell's. I don't want to, I'm not calling Odell a small receiver because the way he jumps and the way his arms extend, he's got a huge catch radius. So he is a valuable weapon in the red zone. But so is a guy that's 6'4 and can jump. So you pair Willies with Odell, with David Njoku, all of a sudden you have some options in the red zone. 
and I think we overlook that sometime. It's tough to score once you get down there, and those kind of receivers help you. Sure, because you're in a bunched area, right? Exactly. I mean, there are fewer areas for the defense to defend at that point, and that's when you have a guy that's 6'4". There aren't many defensive backs that can match up with size like that. Well, exactly right, and the space is constricted, but where it's not constricted is above the ground, right? So that's where you have to – that's where the red zone is different. That's where you create that space is in the air. And Najoku, who is also inconsistent, but he can go up and get the ball. That's one of the things he does – if you start giving Baker those kinds of options, I like your chances better. Again, you're dialed into the brownzone.com zone coverage podcast with Andy Bullbarch and Scott Petrak. And want to move on and talk about Kareem Hunt yeah. because, you know, he's just now started to make the rounds at training camp. And it's interesting to hear some of the things that he's had to say. I know you were right there in the middle of that. Yeah. What were some of your major takeaways from his sit down with the media? Well, it's the first time we talked to him since the latest off field incident. Right, and he got the police talked to him outside a bar. The end of June it was really quick. Nothing's come of it yet. The police never filed a report or anything. But it's the first time we got to talk to him, so he called it a misunderstanding. But it's worth noting, given his history, given the fact he's going to open the season on the eight-game suspension, that the Chiefs cut him because of two physical off-field altercations, including one with a woman. He, you know, kicked and pushed a woman. So. Anything that happens, you have to pay attention to. Not only as a media member, but as an organization. So that's why the Browns called in Kareem to talk to him. John Dorsey, Freddie Kitchens. And they sent a message. He said he took the message to heart. You know, he knows he can't make the same mistakes again. Of course, he said the same thing when we talked to him when he first signed, you know, when he first talked to him before the latest thing. So you just never know with a guy that, and he's young, and this isn't to say he can't turn it around and turn his life around and stay out of trouble, but you just never know when there's going to be another misstep. And I think that's an area of worry for any organization, not just the Browns. But that's how, I, if I were the Browns and I were John Dorsey, your owners, Jimmy and D. Haslam, who said that Kareem knows he's not guaranteed a spot, knows he's got a lot of work to do to keep himself on the roster and become a member of the organization, I would always be worried that the next misstep is coming. It's, and it's, they're not identical situations, but that's how it always was with Josh Gordon. You just never knew something else was going to happen. And obviously, Kareem's track record isn't as bad or isn't as long. You can argue which worse, but it's not as long. Josh Gordon was years and years. Kareem hasn't had that. But when you talk about, okay, he's going to be a huge impact in Week 10, if he's on the field, he will be. But he's got to get there, right? So I guess the point of all this is he says he's doing the right things. He says he's going to try to stay low and keep a low profile and stay out of trouble. And the Browns are giving him that chance. He appreciates their support. Now he's got to prove it. And we won't know until week 10 if he's on the field. Okay, that's a great sign. And then maybe you can build on it. And then maybe he becomes the player he was in Kansas City. And this offense has the potential to do even more because he's that type of player. But you need to see him do it. You need to see him stay out of trouble. And now he's just started to get back on the field, which is good because you want to see him out there. He needs. We were talking about this before, Andy. He needs to get on the field. He's not going to play for the first eight weeks, and he's not going to play Thursday night. So that gives him three preseason games to get all his reps in before he comes back. So of all the people that the preseason is important for, I think it's really important for Kareem Hunt. That leads me into the next question because you hear this from a lot of people. You stated it. He's not going to play until week 10. So it seems like it should be of the utmost importance to get him out there and get him as many preseason reps as possible simply because – that's really the only opportunity he's going to get yep. to get out there and really engage in some in-game physical activity. You can practice all day long, but until you get that real in-game feel back in your system, there's no other way of replicating that. So how many reps do you think he'll see in the last three preseason games? Well, first of all, you're exactly right, and I think what makes it even more important is he hasn't played since, I think it's November 19th of last year, maybe 18th or 19th. It was November. So that's an extra month and a half that he missed of last season. So he needs to get back. He needs to get his football legs back. So I think, you know, I think week four of the preseason is usually a game nobody has to pay attention to. I think Kareem Hunt could carry the ball 25 times that game. Like, to me, that makes all the sense in the world. Give him a bunch of carries. He's got all the time in the world to rest. But let's see what he has. Let's get him into football shape. I'm not taking away carries from Nick Chubb or Duke Johnson if he's back or Dontre Hilliard. In week three, you know, I don't like calling the dress rehearsal, but the dress rehearsal game, 
I'm not taking those reps away early in week three of the preseason or even week two. But as you get in the fourth quarter of those games, I'm giving Kareem Hunt the ball. And week four would be all about Kareem Hunt if it were if I were making those decisions. Yeah, I think a lot of people share that same line of thinking. I mean, if he's not going to play until week 10, clearly it's not much of an injury concern. Right. So, And I think the fans want to see what he's got in the tank at this point since, like you said, he hasn't played since November. It's been a long time. It has. And I'll tell you what, when we saw him in the offseason, because he's only done individual drills the last few days, so we haven't seen a ton of him. But when he was out there taking every rep in the offseason, he looked great. Like He looked a, like a difference maker, which you'd expect from a guy that was – the NFL's leading rusher, right, as a rookie two years ago. So, you know, I don't I – mean, Freddie has been – he's not saying who's going to play in the preseason, but I'd be stunned if the starters played much, if at all, in week four. And it's a home game. But at least that would give the fans something to pay attention to, a reason to show up at the stadium. And that's not why the Browns would do it, but I think it would be a nice benefit for the fans that are paying good money to go watch a game that doesn't mean anything. Sure. I mean, you got to give them something for that fourth game. Yeah, Yeah, because there isn't going to be a whole lot of action with guys that are going to be getting consistently valuable reps on the team. No doubt about that. Well, that leads us to the next question. It's the million-dollar question leading into Thursday's preseason game. And I know so far, Freddie Kitchens has been pretty noncommittal about this, not really stating how much that first team's going to play. Based on all that you're seeing and hearing, how much can we expect to see from the first units on both sides on Thursday night? I don't think you're going to see much. My guess is Baker plays a series. Um, I wouldn't rule out him not playing at all and none of the skill guys playing. Just because I, I think if Freddie knew that they were going to play, he might have said that when we talked to him Tuesday, and he didn't. He was kind of dodged the questions. and To me, it felt like, a guy saying, you know what, I, I just don't want to tell the world I'm not going to play him <laughs> for the first preseason game at home. But I could be wrong. Maybe he gives them, you know, maybe they go out and they play one series and, you know, Baker throws a bubble screen to Odell and then they get off the field. I, I, I could see that scenario. Freddie also mentioned that they've been practicing really hard. They're going to go to Indianapolis next week and practice against the Colts. And he thinks the work there is even better than the preseason. So he just isn't placing much value on the preseason opener. And I completely get that. Um, so I would not be – if I were a fan, I would not go in with the expectations that you're going to see a lot of Baker, a lot of Odell, a lot of Jarvis. I don't think you're going to see many of those guys. You're not going to see any of the starting defensive line because they've all been hurt this week. I don't think it's anything serious. They all seem like minor injuries. But if they didn't practice Monday and Tuesday, they sure as heck aren't going to play on Thursday night in a meaningless preseason game. So you're going to have to look at those second-level guys and – it's, you know, the kicking battle. It's the rookies because the rookies are going to play, right? That's how it works in the NFL. The rookies are going to play. Greedy Williams, Sione Takitaki, Mac Wilson, those guys are guys you can focus on. Pay attention to the offensive line. There's still a right guard battle that needs to be figured out, and all those three guys are going to play. I would assume Kyle Kalis left practice Tuesday, so I don't know for sure if he'll play, but Kyle Cush and uh, Austin Corbett will play. So I think it'll be secondary guys, not – secondary, like defensively, <laughs> the second level guys that you're going to have to pay attention to. And then week two, maybe you'll see more of the starters, week three. But even then, I just think Freddie has practiced these guys so hard that he knows – I just don't think he wants to risk injury to these guys in the preseason. And with the team he has, I think there's a comfort level of knowing, hey, if we get to week one healthy, we'll be okay – I just don't need to see a guy, these guys a bunch in the preseason. And, and we can we can argue about that because there's differing philosophies there. Whether or not you need to play these guys a bunch in the preseason and get their timing down, and I think that's a line Freddie's trying to walk as a first-time head coach. Sure. And, and I think the, the bottom line here, too, is you want to see guys in the first week of the preseason that are still battling for a spot yeah. that could add some value to the roster not next week or the week after, but certainly when things kick off that first weekend in September. You mentioned some of the names some of the secondary guys, some of the yeah. rookies. This right guard battle is not yeah. going away, and, and that seems to be the most intriguing battle in camp right now. How much of that should we be watching for on Thursday? I would also call it the most frustrating battle in camp, especially for the coaching staff. I mean, Freddie is clearly, I don't know, upset, frustrated that he can't find, that nobody's emerged 
you know, and I think I expected it to be Austin Corbett because I've heard good things about him behind the scenes, that he's a smart guy and he's tough and he'll grow into a starting spot, but he hasn't seized it. And when I watch, I'm seeing him get beat. You know, I saw Devereaux Lawrence, a backup D tackle, just steamroll Austin Corbett the other day. It was so bad, Freddie walked up to Devereaux Lawrence and raised his arm in the air and called him the champ because he dominated Corbett on that snap. I don't know if he's trying to send a message to Corbett, like, hey, get your act together. But the point is, the number 33 pick in the draft a year ago hasn't claimed the starting job. You got Kyle Kalis, a guy, an undrafted guy a couple of years ago, hometown kid, strong kid. He hasn't seized the job. And Eric Kush, kind of by default, because he's starting this league, has taken three straight days with the starters just because they need somebody. So... Nobody sees the job. Kush has a chance to come out and play well Thursday night and maybe establish himself. And then you're going to see a bunch of Corbett, whether or not Corbett's going to play some guard. He'll probably play some center. You're going to see him out there a lot, I think, because the Browns are trying to give him the opportunity to show them that they have to give him the job and have to give him a chance, and he just hasn't done that yet. That's going to be something that pops up in a future conversation. I have a yeah. feeling that right guard battle is going to be the most talked about here over the next few weeks. Well, injuries are a big part of camp. We're a couple of weeks in now, and some maybe not as concerning as some others. And I know you've detailed the defensive yeah. line about how the starters in the D line have been really banged up. Yeah. Which of these injuries are most concerning to you? Are there some one? Are there some injuries that really kind of stand out that we should be watching? Yeah, you know I'm okay with the D line. I think those guys will be here week one, and even Miles and Larry, Miles Garrett and Larry and Joby, I expect them to be back in Indianapolis. Um, I'd be worried about anybody that has a concussion, right? So your number two tight end, Demetrius Harris, has a concussion. Haven't seen him on the field in a week. Seth DeVal's been out even longer. He's a guy who had his flash potential but never really done a whole lot in his couple of years. He's been on the roster bubble. The longer you miss, the bubble gets you know, even less stable. So those are two guys I'd be worried about. I think Duke Johnson, the running back, he always has a hamstring injury in training camp. He always shows up week one and never misses a game. I don't think he's missed a game in his career. But given his status as wanting to be traded and kind of just the uncertainty there, it'd be good to see him back on the field. But I don't think that's a big concern. And then the other one that jumps out to me is Damien Ratley, a receiver. He was a draft pick a year ago. He, I, I thought he was going to make this roster, but he's a guy that has to show something. And the longer he's out, he gets passed by a guy like Derek Willies. Maybe a guy like Ishmael Hyman passes him. Um, you know, there's guys on this roster, all of a sudden you're going, you know what, are we keeping six? And if we keep six, is Ratley one of those six? And he's not right now, and I think I think he's will fight for that spot. Right now, to me, it's Willie's is secure is a number five, and the battle for six, if they keep six, is between Jalen Strong and Damian Ratley. Well, Jalen Strong's been playing well lately. He's taken some reps with the ones, and Damian Ratley's on the side riding a bike. So, I think he needs to get back and do something if he wants to keep if he wants to make this roster. Interesting, just because you're right about the bubble. I mean, if you can't play, you can't prove to the coaches that you right. belong. I mean, and that that that's such a tough battle for a lot of these guys at training camp. All right, I want to ask you about one last player here, Elirius Tracy yeah. Sprinkle. Of course, signed with the team. What are the chances he's with the team when they kick off in early September? Yeah, I mean, it's a long shot for Tracy. Number one. He signed late, which is always an uphill battle. Number two, Freddie Kitchens keeps saying the defensive line is the strength of the team. And I mentioned a guy like Devereaux Lawrence. It's a guy, Daniel Ukulele, or I don't know, I'm going to butcher his name, but <laughs> number 96. Ukulele sounded yeah, better. <laughs> yeah, it's close. I know it's close. He has shown up in camp. So some of these backup D tackles have made plays. Having said that, I think Tracy's a guy – that can stick on a practice squad. I think he's an NFL caliber type player. And if there's an injury to one of those guys and Tracy's able to flash in the preseason, it wouldn't be crazy to see him stick around, if not on this roster, somewhere else. Because he, I think he's shown in preseason last year with Carolina and he had a really strong AAF season that he can play in this league. It's a good spot for him to be in just because you're on a roster. He's going to get preseason time. It does it, That'll be crucial for him. And he's a good guy, and he's athletic, and he's overcome a lot of stuff in his life and in his career that it, I'm, I'm really happy for him that he's gotten another chance 
Because I know I've talked to him plenty of times. I know he's just been looking to get that call. And for it to come from the Browns was a shock to him, but he feels blessed beyond belief. There seem to be a few more hometown guys in camp this year. Yeah. I mean, it, it just seems like at least the guys who are in camp are not just there necessarily as favors. These are guys that it seemed oh, yeah. like they have a chance to make the team. Does it seem like there are more, more guys like that this year than years past? Yeah, that might be true. I think it, it feels that way. But it makes sense because there's a lot of homegrown talent, right? I mean, there's a lot of good high school football. There's a lot of really good college football. And I do think that that was a deficiency of some of the former regimes. And it's all you have to do is point to Ohio State. The fact that they didn't have an Ohio State guy for so long. And I'm not an Ohio State hammer or homer by any stretch. But it didn't make sense when they had some of the best talent in college football and the Browns weren't drafting them. And... John Dorsey only needed to go to pick number four last year to reverse that with Denzel Ward, and I think the trends just continued. Absolutely. Ohio State hammer. See, as a Northwestern guy, I'm a Michigan State guy, so I feel like you and I could have a whole lot of fun with that term. (laughs) So we'll leave that for a different show. But it's come to that point in the show where we get to talk about your golf game. I want to take a look at your golf shot of the week. Where did it take place, and when along the way did it take place? Yeah, it was uh, Sunday. One of my buddies is a member at Weymouth. Country Club down in Medina, and he asked me if I could get out there, and the Browns had the day off, so I was able to get out there. And I hit some good long irons, which is always nice because, you know, obviously they could be hit or miss. But the one that stands out for me, I want to say it was number 16. I hit just a decent drive, and it was a dog leg left, and I was kind of st- stuck a little bit. I wasn't sure I could get the ball around, but I hit a really good four iron up and over these trees to about – 15 feet. I didn't make the putt, but I parted. it. Um, but it was just a really good four iron because I didn't. I had no idea if I was going to be able to get it there. Was it going to be able to go over the trees, curve a little left, and I get up there and it's just where I want it to be. Perfect, man. So, yeah. Very nice. Yeah, and I had enough of those four irons, six irons all day that I felt good about the game. Will you get a chance to go here over the next uh, six or seven days? Will you get a chance to go before the preseason game on Thursday? Yeah, that's the hope. You know, I don't have to be down at the stadium till. 4.35, so I'm hoping to get out uh, Thursday morning. And then they got a late practice Friday, so I might be able to go back-to-back. We'll see. We'll see if I'm able to get done, get enough work in and get enough sleep if I can get up early Friday morning and play. Should be done raining, so it looks like yeah. Mother Nature's going to cooperate, if nothing else. Good stuff. Scott, as always, a pleasure, and we'll have a lot to talk about next week when the Browns play their first preseason game. And well, it seems like this is the kind of camp that's not going to be short on storylines, that's for sure. No, we'll have plenty to talk about. Absolutely. Scott, thanks as always. Always a pleasure. Again, that's another episode of the brownzone.com zone coverage podcast. For Scott Petrek, this is Andy Bullbarch saying thank you so much for tuning in. We'll come, we'll catch you again next week. Catch you again next week. Catch you again next week. Catch you again next week.